Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Thomas More Institute's webinar on tracing time in Percy Bysshe Shelley's poetry. Um, well, while our panelists and participants for this webinar are dispersed worldwide, the Thomas More Institute is located in Montreal, which is part of Kenya Tahaga territory. We would like to acknowledge that these unceded lands have a long history and stewardship by many Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg. Jojage, or Muniyang, or Montreal, is historically an important meeting place for several Indigenous nations. Through our programming or through individual research, we invite everyone to join us in learning more about the histories of the different lands we live on. The Thomas More Institute, for people who are unfamiliar with us, is a uh, adult education institute that offers university level discussion courses in the liberal arts. Um, as of July the 4th, our next year's uh, course offerings will be online uh, at the Thomas More uh, website. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be distributed later in the week for, for anybody who's interested. Participants can enter questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and they will be um, asked at the end of the interview. So our guest here tonight is Jonathan Sachs. He's Professor of English at Concordia University, Montreal. He's the author of The Poetics of Decline in British Romanticism, Romantic Antiquity, Rome in the British Imagination, 1789 to 1832, and with the Multigraph Collective, Interacting with Print, Elements of Reading in the Era of Print Saturation. Most recently, he has co-edited with Professor Andrew Stauffer, a new critical edition, Lord Byron, Selected Works for the 20th Century Oxford Authors Series. Sachs has held fellowships at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and the National Humanities Center. Our interviewers are Zoe Shaw and Charlotte Boatner Doan. Charlotte Boatner Doan has an MA in English from McGill University and teaches English literature and writing at Dawson College in Montreal. She's a member of the curriculum committee at the Thomas More Institute, as well as a course leader and designer. Zoe Shaw is a writer and editor based in Montreal. She has an MA in English from McGill University. Her interests are in lyric poetry, eco-criticism and activism in creative industries. She is the administrative services coordinator at the Thomas More Institute, as well as a course leader and designer. And now I will uh, turn it over to, to you three. Great, thank you so much Imogen and thank you so much Jonathan for being with us tonight. We wanted to start things off by asking if uh, you Jonathan would give us just a little background on some of the, the major topics that we'll be covering. Um, so maybe a little bit about romanticism, uh, the life of Shelley and a bit uh, about Ode uh, to the West Wind in particular. Great, thank you. Thank you Imogen for your introduction and thank you to Charlotte and Zoe for agreeing to take the time to do this interview. It was a really nice invitation to receive and I'm, I'm really happy to be here tonight and thank all of you for your time in coming to listen. So why don't I speak briefly first about what we consider romanticism to be, which is a notoriously tricky term around which there has been a lot of critical controversy and a substantial lack of critical consensus, scholarly consensus I should say. Uh, the intellectual historian A.O. Lovejoy said that romanticism could only be grasped in the plural as romanticisms, uh, that, that it was a multitude of, of things and, and, and couldn't be turned into the singular, uh, to which in a famous response, the literary scholar Rene Wellick offered three traits for romanticism. He said that romanticism was about imagination for the view of poetry, nature for the view of the world, and symbol and myth for poetic style. Uh, I think that the minute you start reaching for a firm definition like that, you can pick holes in it. And so it's probably more helpful to think of these three concepts, imagination, nature, and symbol and myth, uh, 
uh, as, as part of a family resemblance. You can generally find a poet that will fulfill one or two, sometimes three of these traits, but not necessarily all of them. And yet that doesn't make that, that figure fundamentally distinct from others. So I think that uh, that works as, as a kind of working definition of romanticism, this, this emphasis on, on nature, imagination, symbol and myth. Um, and uh, we can complicate that in our discussion if we want to, uh, but I think it, it, it bears in, in the reading that we'll do today with Shelley's Ode to the West Wind. So who was Shelley, the author of, of the poem that we'll be discussing today? Uh, Percy Shelley was, was a, a reasonably um, privileged figure in England at, at the turn of the 18th to the 19th century. He, his father uh, became a, a, a nobleman with the, with the title Sir. Uh, Shelley inherited quite a bit of money and his family uh, was a prominent English family. His father was also a member of parliament. Uh, Shelley himself was a bit of a rebel. He didn't get along with his father and was consistently trying to show himself off as different from his father. He went to Eton College, one of the most prestigious public schools in England, uh, where um, he wrote poetry and worked on some Gothic novels, which he later published while well, he was an undergraduate at Oxford. Uh, he didn't do very well. Actually, sorry, I forgot I had a PowerPoint. Um, why don't I share screen and show that? Um, sorry about that. Uh, oops. Um, great. So there's Shelley. Um, so yeah, that's the house in which he grew up, Field Place in Sussex. Uh, then there is uh, Eton College where he went to, to school. Uh, and there's a picture of his school room uh, with Shelley carving his name onto the wainscoting, which you see around that room. Um, and then uh, there's University College Oxford where Shelley had a rather unfortunate career. Uh, he spent two terms there. And in his second term, he published a pamphlet called The Necessity of Atheism, uh, which was very controversial at a high church college uh, or a high church university like Oxford. And Shelley was promptly expelled um, much to the consternation of, of his uh, dominating father. Um, he completed the sweep uh, after being expelled by running off with a young 16 year old girl named Harriet Westbrook and taking her up to Scotland to be married. Uh, and then spent the next three years running around England uh, and Ireland and Wales, trying to stir up political controversy um, for about three years. Uh, after which he returned to London, largely at the urging and through correspondence with the prominent philosopher, William Godwin, uh, through whom he met William Godwin's daughter, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, uh, with whom he quickly became enamored. And in 1814, he left Harriet Shelley, his, his then wife, uh, and their children, uh, and eloped to the continent with Mary, Wollst Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin. Um, and uh, that was the, the, the summer of 1814, after which he returned to England uh, and, and spent some time um, moving around, not, not uh, terribly fixed in place. Um, and then uh, in 1816, he and Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin went back to Europe, where they spent the summer with Lord Byron uh, in what was known as the famous Frankenstein summer. Um, here, uh, in largely in Byron's house, which is the Villa Diodati, Shelley took a house nearby, uh, and the, the, the group spent a lot of time um, in this house, uh, which is where the famous ghost story competition took place that gave rise to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. They returned to England at the end of the summer, and shortly after their return, Shelley's first wife, Harriet Shelley, committed suicide in the Serpentine in London, uh, which for Percy Shelley meant that he was now free to marry Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, uh, who became Mary Shelley. Uh, and at that point, the pair settled in Marlow, uh, which is outside of London. It's quite suburban now, as you can see from that picture, but at the time it was a little bit more um, rural. Uh, they spent uh, two years there, 1817 and 1818, before ultimately deciding to return to Europe and settle in Italy in, uh, from 1818 forward. The time in Italy was extremely tumultuous. They spent, uh, they made 17 moves and lost two children. Uh, so it was, it was a really difficult time for the Shelleys and, and at various times, both of them were depressed uh, and, and struggling. Um, and uh, this, was, this was also uh, a, a time to, uh, this is when Shelley wrote a lot of his major poetry. He wrote the Ode to the West Wind in Florence uh, as part of the project that would become published as Prometheus Unbound uh, and then spent 
ultimately the, the rest of his life. He, he died in 1821 while he was immersed in conceiving of a, of a new publication project that was going to be done jointly with Lord Byron and his friend uh, Lee Hunt. Uh, and while Shelley was helping the Hunts to get settled, he took his boat, which was named after Byron's poem, the, the Don Juan, uh, and he ended up uh, drowning on his return from helping the Hunts to get settled. And this is a famous painting of Shelley being cremated. Uh, and you can see this gentleman here with the big white collar uh, is Lord Byron, who in an apocryphal story uh, reached into the flames and, and plucked Shelley's heart out from the, the beer of his cremation. Uh, Shelley was ultimately buried at the non-Catholic cemetery in Rome, where you can see uh, his tomb today. Um, and the uh, tombstone bears the words from Shakespeare's The Tempest, nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. Um, so those are the, the bare events of, of Shelley's life. Uh, but the, the key point to note about that, and I'll take off my screen share, um, the key point to note about that was the way in which Shelley conceived of himself fundamentally in opposition to figures of authority and into traditional forms of political authority. He was a, he was a real radical radical figure. Uh, and through uh, time, his, his legacy has, has been embraced variously for that radicalism, but he's also been embraced not so much for his active political work and more for uh, his idealism and for his abstraction. Uh, Matthew Arnold famously dismissed Shelley as an ineffectual angel. Uh, and the later 20th century critic F.R. Levis suggested that Shelley had a weak grasp on the actual. So there's a lot of tension in the reception of Shelley between those who dismiss Shelley as a kind of airy, fairy, um, head in the clouds kind of figure, and those who recognize him for more of a, of a radical, as part of, more as part of a radical political tradition. He was famously read, for example, by Marx uh, and by many of the, the Chartist, uh, the, the very um, radical Chartist figures in, in mid 19th century Britain, including Ernst Jones and others. Um, so I'll leave it at that, um, but certainly open to, to questions if, if they come up. Um, so let's talk then a little bit about the poem uh, with, with Shelley's life in mind. Uh, the poem calls itself an ode to the West Wind, and it might be helpful, I think, to take a step back and just ask ourselves what an ode is. Uh, and it's a slightly tricky term again, because oftentimes when we speak about poetic form, we speak in connection with meter and rhyme. And if you think about what, uh, say, um, well, I'm going to particular examples, but but when you think about a, a formal rhyme scheme for a poem, it's quite easy to identify. An ode, I think, might better be thought of as a shaping form uh, in contrast to a, a metrical form, a form that identifies quite explicitly what its meter and what its rhyme scheme is going to be, in the sense that um, there is no given meter or rhyme that you have to use for an ode, okay? Uh, and so as a shaping form, an ode might be thought of more as an environment for poetry, right? If, 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 if rhyme forms the architecture of a poem, uh, the, the shaping form might be thought of as, as its environment. Uh, and so um, in particular, uh, an ode is commonly used to celebrate or elevate something. Uh, and it's a, it's a mood that, that is galvanized in the Romantic period as a form for examining um, personal crisis through uh, lyric form. Um, there's, as I said, no given meter or rhyme attached to an ode, and so that means that one can do what one wants in terms of how you want to organize its, its, its rhythm or, or its meter. If you look, for example, at Keats's famous odes, which he wrote also in 1819 when Shelley wrote The Ode to the West Wind, they don't all have the same rhyme scheme, but there is a rhyme scheme. There is a, there is a rhythmic and a metrical pattern, but it, 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 it isn't... Um, set and in, in it, 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 it's not formalized in other words you can you can follow the rhyme but there's nothing that says that an ode has to have x number of lines per stanza and x number of stanzas and what's interesting about that is that that Shelley really plays with the relationship between what I'm calling the environment of a shaping form and the more architectural demands of a metrical or, or rhyme scheme. Uh, and specifically in the Ode to the West Wind, as you may have noticed, uh, it consists of five stanzas, 
each of which has 14 lines. So that means that each of the five stanzas constitutes a sonnet. But instead of going with one of the more traditional sonnet forms, the English Shakespearean sonnet or the Italian sonnet, what Shelley does is he adapts terza rima, which is the rhyme scheme that Dante uses in the Inferno, well, in the Divine Comedy, uh, and he adapts it into the sonnet form. Now, terza rima is an Italian rhyme scheme that we might think of as a kind of sandwich. Uh, it takes an A rhyme uh, and contrasts it with a B rhyme and then returns the A rhyme to close its, uh, its, its stanza, okay? Um, and then the middle rhyme, the B rhyme, becomes the, the framing rhyme for the next stanza. So it goes A, B, A, and then the B rhyme comes out and becomes B, C, B. And so what Shelley does in the Ode to the West Wind is he plays with terza rima and writes 12 lines of terza rima closed by a couplet. Uh, we'll talk about this more perhaps in the discussion, but what that offers us is a kind of tangled or knotted form that ultimately closes itself off with a couplet before bouncing into a new stanza. It's really quite a, a dynamic use of form here. Um, and that is part of the reason that I, that I chose the poem. Uh, I think that, that this poem is an excellent introduction to Shelley's work because it's short. Um, it, it's fairly quick to read. Uh, it's intricate and formally distinct through the manner that I've just described with its particular combination of, of terz rima and sonnet in its stanzas. Um, it's also quite beautiful. Uh, if you listen to the poem, uh, there's, a, there's a very particular sound to it. Um, and that sound is interesting because, for example, I, I referred earlier to the, to the British mid 20th century critic F.R. Leavis. Uh, and, and Levis, for example, suggested that Shelley's poetry was unreadable, uh, but that the effects of a poem like the Ode to the West Wind come from the sweeping movement of the verse with its accompanying plangency. Um, and you can think of the poem itself, where Shelley refers, for example, to the incantation of this verse. And I think that's a really good place to start with it, uh, just to read the poem aloud and to listen to the way that its words work, because it can be a tricky poem, I think, to interpret. Uh, and part of the reason for that has also to do with Shelley's tendency to dwell in abstraction and to inweave his similes so that he'll start by talking about something in relationship to something else. And then almost as if he's forgotten the initial term, he'll get deeper and deeper into that abstraction. It can be very difficult, for example, in the Ode to the West Wind to pin down precisely the images that Shelley is constructing. Uh, but I don't think that need get in our way. Uh, and, and it's helpful, I think, with a poem like this to start just with the way that it sounds. Um, so I think it makes for a very good introduction to Shelley, um, both for those formal qualities, for its qualities of sound, and as we'll discuss later, for the actual content of the poem, um, which stands as, as a kind of pay on to hopeful change. So I'll pause there. Um, Thanks so much. I think that's really helpful context uh, for um, both people who are quite familiar with the study of literature, but also people who aren't. And so uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I think we wanted to start with uh, a major theme that comes up in the title of this webinar, which is time. Um, and you've sent us, in addition to Ode to the West Wind, an article that you've written about slow time. And we were wondering, what does it mean really to read slow time in a poem, for example? And is there something unique about slow time in the context of romanticism? Thanks, that's a great question, Zoe. Uh, my sense is that, that the way that I'm using a term like so, slow time, I wanna highlight what I consider to be what's temporally distinct about romanticism. So what I mean by that is that, that there are many different ways to think about what is novel in romanticism. One of those ways would be to think about romanticism as a reaction and a response to the French Revolution and as a, a, a literary movement that is invested in concepts uh, of um, rights and um, politics and these kind of things. Uh, you can think of romanticism also as the revival of romance forms from earlier uh, 
in, in, in the millennium from, from sort of um, medieval romance forms that which it contrasts to classical forms. You can think of it also in connection with philosophical aesthetics and its belief in, in what an artwork is or, or its sense that an artwork is somehow separate from uh, and, and special. Um, we'll leave it there. Um, but one of the things that I, I mean to suggest by thinking of romanticism in connection with time is to get at what I consider to be one of the most distinctive features of the period. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is that there's um, a sense in this period that things are happening more quickly uh, than before. And that's connected, I think, to the French Revolution, but it doesn't necessarily come directly from it. Um, it's more, I think, a product of what we might call print culture. Uh, and the way in which uh, print isn't invented in this period, but more and more things are being printed and more and more kinds of things are being printed. Newspapers, broadsides, uh, quarterly journals, weekly journals. There's, there's more and more stuff to read. Uh, and a lot of that, as Wordsworth famously describes in his preface to the lyrical ballads, is keyed to a sense that more things are happening and therefore more things need to be written about. So Wordsworth, for example, wrote about that um, as a craving, in connection with what he calls a craving for eventfulness, uh, a craving that he sees as being answered by rapid communication. So if we see romanticism as a product possibly of political revolution in France, my suggestion would be that we need to recognize it also as a product of, of what we might call a media revolution in England, a media revolution connected with more and more things coming out for people to read. And the sense that more and more things are happening is sense consequently things are happening faster. Uh, and what becomes interesting about that, when you think about that sense of, of hurry, which is something that we associate with our contemporary digital life, uh, one of the things that, that, that you discover pretty quickly when you delve into the print culture of the Romantic period is that they felt about print much as we feel about digital communication. Oh my gosh, there's so much of it. How can I possibly keep up? Uh, and so the sense that things are rushing past. Um, but that that pairs, I think, or contrasts quite significantly with the development of geology and the earth sciences in this period, which point not to how quickly things are moving, but rather to how slowly they're moving and, and how long it takes for change to happen. Uh, and so you have two very different models of change with those two different paces. The, the quickness and, and, and what we might call deep time. And so when I think about slow time in the period, I'm trying to posit it as a kind of in-between time, uh, a time in which one notices time, um, but a time in which one notices time in relationship to these two contrary poles, right? In, in which one notices experiences where time seems to slow down in relationship to a more a pre a pressing feeling of rush and hurry, um, but also a feeling that, that one, e even as one senses things happening more quickly, uh, people are becoming more and more aware of just how much time the earth has been around and how long it takes for certain geographical and geological features of the earth to change. Um, and so when I think about time in that way, uh, I mean to suggest that, that the sense of time in Romanticism comes from the collision between those two distinct senses of time. And I think that registers in the poetry of the period when you start to look for the way in which it, it deals with effects of pace. You can see it picking up on things happening quickly and slowly at the same time, and the kind of temporal confusions that that produces. Um, so that's part of what I'm after with the idea of slow time. Great, thank you. So you touched on uh, the poem's form a bit in your introduction, but in a poem like Ode to the West Wind, how is Shelley playing with time, both in terms of the, the content, but also in terms of uh, the form itself, specifically uh, the use of rhyme and meter, both, you know, how do we see time passing in nature in the poem and also our experience of time uh, as readers as we're reading the poem? Yeah, that's a great question. One of the things I think that that meter does in a poem like this is it is it controls our experience of time and timing as we read. I mean, meter is is a way of keeping time, if you will, in a poem. Uh, and so by using a very tightly controlled form with that combination of, of terza rima and uh, the sonnet in each stanza, um, Shelley ensures a certain balance between the time that it takes to read each moment of the poem. We can talk a little bit about the parallelisms that arise from that and also the asymmetries that arise. Uh, for example, um, there's you could look at the poem as offering us a stanza 
on various aspects of environmental shift, right? The first stanza then becomes about the way in which this changing of the season affects the land. The second stanza becomes about the way in which the changing of the season affects the air or atmosphere. And the third stanza becomes about the way in which seasonal change affects water. Um, and when you start to think about that, right, it, it makes a pretty nice triad. But if that's the triad, why is it that the poem has five stanzas? Um, and if you start to think about the elemental qualities to which it's referring, right, we have earth, air and water. Uh, well, what happens in that in that strange fourth stanza where if you want to think along the lines of, of the four essential elements is, is earth, water, air, and fire, uh, you're kind of expecting fire when you get to stanza four, but instead you get the poet. Um, and, and we can talk more about that in a bit um, and, and the way in which we might link that to fire. Um, but uh, so, so it's a poem that uses these carefully constructed qualities of form to which I've been referring um, to frame our experience of reading it, but that also plays with those very qualities, right? It wants to offer us triads, but it hints that there might be more than just triads. It, it, it's a poem that's, that's never still, and that's also never just one thing would be one of the things I want to underscore. And so just to, to wrap up my response, uh, there's a way in which the, the, the meter and the rhythm controls our reading of the poem, uh, but what the poem is offering us is a model of repetition, um, but it's repetition with change, right? And, and so there's a way in which each stanza offers us an account of the effects of the wind and seasonal change, which would recur every year, right, um, in a kind of unchanging pattern. Uh, and so uh, what I find distinctive about that is the way that that plays with the form, right? The form itself links from one to the next to the next in, in the way that that middle rhyme comes out and frames that the next three lines. Uh, but it also offers us a vision of change. So it, it's a kind of repetition with change because by the time we get to that final stanza of the poem, which we'll look at shortly, uh, it does offer us a kind of breaking out of that seasonal uh, repetition, the suggestion that somehow things will be different in the future. Um, and the question of how they will be different remains an open question. Yeah, I think maybe my next question might kind of be part of the tail end of that answer. And then maybe this, this might be, um, uh, time to start looking at that last stanza, but the question is, in, in addition to Shelley, the poet, constructing the passing of time, how does this, how does Shelley, the speaker, or Shelley's persona's creative power construct the passing of time in a different way, or does it? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I, I want to think carefully about how I answer it. And you can see me kind of pausing a bit because I've become a little bit uncomfortable with the way in which we like to think about the speaker of these poems as a persona and to differentiate that persona from, from the author of the poem. And I worry sometimes that that's an effect of later criticism, that that's, that's, that, that that's the effect of a kind of criticism that, that follows the dramatic monologue. Uh, where we are so firmly encouraged to make a difference between the poet and the speaker. And I'm not sure that, that Shelley would have recognized um, the idea of constructing some other person to, to voice the, the words of the poem. But, but I take your question really as getting at this issue of, of how one affects change and, and whether there's agency or whether one is acted upon. Is that, is that part of what you're after? Um, yes, definitely. Because I think that's fundamental to the poem, right? And there's a way in which, uh, and we, maybe we should look at that final stanza. Would, would it be helpful to, to read it? Because this is, I think, really where this, this issue comes up. Um, but, but yeah, why don't we do that? Should we, should we, should we, should we look at, at, at the final stanza? Yeah, that'd be great. Why don't I do a screen share uh, and then we can go from there. Um, and... Uh, I'll just, sorry, I'll just roll through to the end. There it is. Okay. Okay. Is that, is that clear? Can we see that slide? Except I can't. Um, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll read from the, the um, 
tiles of faces are covering up the opening lines on my screen. So I'll just, I'll read off my, my book. Um, so the final stanza begins then, make me thy lyre, even as the forest is. What if my leaves are falling like its own? The tumult of thy mighty harmonies will take from both a deep autumnal tone, sweet though in sadness. Be thou spirit fierce, my spirit. Be thou me, impetuous one. Drive my dead thoughts over the universe like withered leaves to quicken a new birth. And by the incantation of this verse, scatter as from an unextinguished hearth, ashes and sparks, my words among mankind. Be through my lips to unawakened earth, the trumpet of a prophecy. O oh, wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind. So I'll leave the, the poem up there briefly while we, while we talk about it. But uh, in response to your question, Zoe, I, I think that, that one of the things that's in tension here is the relationship between the poet as a figure who is acted on and the poet as a figure who, who affects or causes change. And in part, what the speaker of the poem, or what Shelley, as, 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 as I think we, we should think of it as, what, what Shelley is trying to ask is, to what extent can I make things happen? To what extent can I make things change? And to what extent am I part of some sort of larger movement or larger force, which he will call later uh, the spirit of, of, of the age? Um, and I think that, that this is a really interesting stanza in which to think about that. And we could think about it through images of instruments and instrumentality for a start, right? If you look at that, the opening line here, make me thy lyre, even as the forest is. What he's referring to here is, is a famous romantic figure of the Aeolian harp, which is a kind of instrument that one puts in a window. And as the wind blows through the window, it plays, uh, it makes a music out of that harp. So there's a way in which um, the harp isn't actively played by a person or an agent, uh, it's simply an effect of the movement of the wind. Uh, and yet by the end of the poem, uh, there's this reference to another instrument, the trumpet, the trumpet of a prophecy. Uh, and we could wonder here whether what's happening is that the wind is blowing through the trumpet, which doesn't seem to make as much sense uh, as it does for an Aeolian harp. Um, it would seem that the wind would have to be playing uh, into the poet who is then playing the trumpet. Um, and so again, that raises this question of, of how it is that we think about change in the context of, of repetition and how it is that we think about the possibility of a different future. And I think that one of the things that, that Shelley seems to be suggesting here is a kind of, of paradoxical version of agency where the wind makes the poet who makes the wind, who makes the poet, um, and, and, and it leaves that very much unresolved. Uh, and I think that for me, that's one of the things that's interesting about the poem and potentially about poetry more generally, that it's a, it's a, it's a way of writing that's also a way of thinking. And it becomes a, a, a way that we can work through our thoughts in a manner that doesn't have to be to if you excuse the pun, instrumental. Um, you can try out ideas, uh, and and you can you can you can offer um, an address to problems without necessarily resolving them or fixing them uh, concretely. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that's happening here with this question of agency. And if you wanted to think, should I pause for a second, um, or shall we talk about agency in connection to time? You can, you can continue. Okay, I'll, I'll keep going then. So, and that's, that, that becomes one, one of the key questions of the poem then, right, is, is, is that when and how does change happen, right? This is a poem about seasonal repetition. The autumn wind comes and, and, and uh, brings change, right? Um, but the idea is that change will soon give way to the next season. Um, and so there's a way in which you could see it as a purely, um, cyclical poem uh, in that it plays with the, the changes of the seasons, which is a kind of change, but it's a kind of change that, that is also a repetition. And yet it seems to want something that is going to break that pattern of repetition, that's going to offer something that is significantly different. Uh, and I think that's what happens in this final stanza when Shelley talks about quickening a new birth and offering the trumpet of a prophecy. Uh, that to me seems, seems one, of, one of the most important temporal effects of the poem, because it takes us through this moment of seasonal repetition 
which it embraces and immerses itself in. And yet it also seems to suggest that things might be different in the future. Uh, and of course, what might be different in the future is not a lack of seasonal repetition, um, but, but a kind of shift to the way in which the seasons become metaphorical and the inevitability of seasonal change comes to stand for the inevitability of political or social change. Uh, and the question of when that will happen is a vexed one. Uh, and what Shelley seems to be suggesting with this poem is that it seems as if we're mired in a cycle of endless repetition, but there will come a change. And we could talk a little bit potentially about the political circumstances that surround the poem, or we could bracket that for later. I'll stop share for now um, and pause. Let's see, where does that go? Yeah, I was going to pick up on that question of when does change happen and maybe ask you if, you know, how could we read this poem as relating to Shelley's political concerns, uh, the revolutions that are, are occurring or have just occurred, what kinds of shifts of, in climate are, are going on at this moment? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And it's one of the things I didn't talk about when I talked about the life of Shelley. I spoke mostly about the events in his life. And I probably could have framed that also through the broader events of his lifetime as much as his life. And one of the things that's very significant about Shelley's life is that he's born in 1792. So he's born um, after the start of the French Revolution and he's born just before the start of the Revolutionary Wars. And so most, for most of Shelley's youth and adolescence, England is at war with France and that war doesn't end until 1815. There's a brief pause from 1801 to 1802. But the point is that, that for Shelley's entire adolescence, England would have been at war with France. And a lot of the kinds of reform uh, that Shelley was invested in, he was significantly invested in, in, in women's rights. He was invested in vegetarianism. He was invested in various anti-colonial projects connected to the boycott of sugar, for example, anti-slavery, um, anti anything establishment, you name it, he was in it. Um, but the point is that, that for most of his, his lifetime, uh, this was a period in which dissenting opinions weren't tolerated because the country was at war. And so when that war ended in 1815, there was a sense that perhaps now things would change and we could speak about reforming parliament. We could speak about expanding the franchise. We could speak about extending rights uh, from outside of Anglicanism uh, to those of other uh, creeds and faiths. Uh, and that led to the return of political protest and political activism that was then very quickly shut down again. Uh, and so Shelley conceived himself in his, in his post-adolescent life as living in a time of significant reaction. And so much of his poetry was written as explicitly political poetry in opposition to what he conceived of as a reactionary government in England. Um, and I think that, that the ode fits into that, that, that one of the things that's happening here uh, is that Shelley is writing metaphorically about just how bad things are. And what's interesting about that is the way in which one could get immersed in that badness. We, we certainly find that tempting today, especially when we think about problems like climate, um, which would be one of our most pressing issues. And there's a recognition of that in Shelley. Uh, but there's also a correspondent sense of hope. And so, so there's, a, there's a really interesting interplay, I think, between hope and despair in his work, um, between what the Italian philosopher slash political theorist Antonio Gramsci called uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. And I think you see that throughout Shelley's work, that there's a way in which you can take a good, hard, critical look at a situation and say, hey, things are bad. Uh, and that's in part what he's doing when he describes the force of this autumnal wind uh, bringing death uh, back into the world uh, and, and producing circumstances of decay and storm and tempest everywhere. Uh, and yet there's this sense, and you get this very much in, in the final stanza, that, that things will change uh, and, and that, that if winter comes, can spring be far behind, that, that, that these conditions of political reaction have to give way at some point. And that's a consistent theme of Shelley's work, especially in these years, 1819, 1820, 1821. And he's trying to call a sense of, of hope or, or optimism out of what he perceives of as a really desultory political situation. Uh, and, and we could think about that, I think, in connection with the role of the poet, uh, and, and that, that one of the things that, that Shelley is trying to do here is to help people not fall into that pattern of despair, uh, 
Um, but he's not naive either, right? He recognizes that we can understand, grasp, and acknowledge how bad things are. But to understand, grasp, and acknowledge how bad things are doesn't mean that we have to get stuck in the belief that they always will be so. Uh, and that, to me, is what's really interesting about this poem, the way it offers us a sense of comfortable repetition that that is nonetheless framed and shadowed by the possibility of significant change. But the question, of course, is when that change will come, right? And that is not answered, right? We don't know when that change will come. We don't know how long it takes for significant change to happen. We don't know whether Shelley expects that change to be something that transpires in the next month, in the next year, not in his lifetime in the lifetime of his children. We don't, we don't know. And, and to me, um, that vagueness, that unwillingness to specify the when is part of what bolsters a sense of hope. Uh, but it's part also of, of what makes the poem um, powerful uh, in that it leaves that when as an open question. In the, uh, the article that you uh, shared with us for this evening, you talk about um, how Darwin and William Playfair turned to visual aids to uh, represent the vast scale of time of evolutionary change and, and economic change in their theories. Um, and how can a poem like Go to the West Wind function in a similar way to a visual aid in helping us grasp the, the nature of slow time? It's a great question, Charlotte. I guess my answer would be in shorthand, that it does something different, right? That if you wanna go back to, to the piece on, on slow time where I showed, I don't have a, an image of it to share on the screen, but I showed the what's known as the tree of life image from Darwin's um, theory of evolution, the origin of species. And what Darwin is doing in that image is showing how slight variation can accumulate over time. Um, but also how it doesn't always accumulate over time. If you look at some of, of the middle uh, threads of, of that tree, you notice that some of them continue almost in a straight line with very little variation. And so Darwin is using that chart as a way of helping us to understand a couple of things. One is incremental change over time. And two is that incremental change over time doesn't need to be consistent. In other words, each one of the lines or branches of that tree doesn't unfold and unfurl and change in the same way. Okay, so it works, I think, very effectively as a way of imagining how gradual change can eventually, if given enough time, produce very significant differences. The question then becomes, how long does it take and how much time does it take? Uh, and Darwin's point is that it takes a really, really, really long time. Uh, it takes so long, in fact, that it's almost impossible to imagine. And I, I use the example in the essay, can you grasp the difference mentally between 10 million and 11 million years. It's a huge difference. It's a million years difference. Uh, and yet the mind won't go there uh, in the way that if I ask you to think about what it feels like to live through a year and what it feels like to live through two years, uh, it's very easy for us to perform that operation. Um, so there's a point at which even if one keeps scale in perspective, the scale becomes so enormous as to make uh, imagination difficult. And so my suggestion would be that that chart helps us to imagine on a scale that, that we can't intuit, okay? Um, and it's slightly different, I think, from the image that Playfair offers us, which is just a straight up time series line graph. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was the inventor of it. Uh, but what the time series line graph does is it helps us to convert large masses of raw data into a single image so that we can see a pattern forming in the data that might not otherwise be evident if we were just looking at a mess of numbers, okay? So in each case, and this, this is the point, right? In each case, it's the visual aid that helps us to imagine change over time, okay? Uh, and what I think is significant about putting that in relationship to poetry is that that's absolutely not what poetry does. Um, that poetry doesn't offer us a particular kind of firmly colored map to imagine change over time. But it does offer us access to possibilities of imagination that are perhaps somewhat different from the visual. 
And so my suggestion would be that in the way in which poetry works through time and plays with time and often thematizes time as part of its content, as, as Shelley's poem does, um, that it offers us alternate ways also to imagine time uh, and to imagine time transpiring slowly uh, and then all at once, which I think is what the Ode to the, to the West Wind does, is, is there's a way in which, and again, to return to its formal qualities, there's a way in which it's predictable repetitions push against the vision of dramatic or prophetic change that it seems also to want to offer us. And in that sense, I think that, that we might think of that as a temporal experience, right? The, 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 the firm architectural pattern of the verse helps us to anticipate what's going to come next. Uh, it makes change not be terribly What's the word I'm looking for? Um, it makes change not terribly surprising, right? The pattern is predictable. And yet if you, if you follow the tension between that predictable pattern and the actual contents of the poem, they initially appear to be aligned in that each one of the first three stanzas offers us evidence of seasonal change. And it's only when we turn to that figure of the poet and the possibilities of poetry in the final two stanzas that we start to see the content of the poem tear itself away, I think, from the predictable architecture of its form. And I think that tearing away is significant. And I think that tearing away is one of the ways in which poetry thinks through form. Um, and that, that's one of its most distinctive features. Thanks so much. So I, I think we're going to uh, shift themes a little bit toward uh, climate and nature. And so if anyone has any more questions about time specifically, you can put that in the Q&A. Um, but our first question is, so Romanticism, as you mentioned at the beginning, is famed for its representation of uh, nature, um, specifically in proximity to the artist. Um, can we um, articulate Shelley's relationship to nature in a particular way, perhaps as ownership over nature or sympathy with nature or something in between or other than those two categories? It's a great question, Zoe. And I think that, that in part, uh, both things are at play here. Uh, and one of the things that I would point to would be the idea of climate change as we understand it now is obviously not current in the Romantic period. Uh, and yet one of the potential ironies of that is that when we start to think about geological periodization and when we introduce this new concept of the Anthropocene, uh, we can debate and discuss when we think that starts. But for many people, they place the beginnings of the Anthropocene with the so-called industrial revolution and, and, and with the, the invention of, of the mass-produced steam engine in, in the late 18th century uh, and the way in which that accelerates industrial change and industrial production, specifically in England and then later in Europe. And so um, climate change is something that we often associate with the Romantic period. Uh, and yet this is also this, this moment in terms of, of, of culture that we that we associate with the embrace of nature and and with a, 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 an attempt to cultivate deep sympathy between humans and their natural environment uh, notably in British romantic poetry um, and so there's a, there's there's a kind of coherence and attention there uh, and and th there's there's a way in which when we think about climate change, and when we think about nature, we don't often make the connection between those two things, but the very climate that we now understand to be changing uh, at the moment of romantic poetry is the nature that these romantic poets are celebrating. Uh, and I think that when you start to think about their celebration of nature and their embrace of nature, we can see the way that produces a kind of filiation with eco-criticism and its understanding of the relationship between humans and nature now turned on its head uh, as one in which humans should be more respectful of nature. Uh, and there's a way in which the ethos of that can be found in romantic poetry, which values nature as nature. 
Um, now, having said that, that doesn't mean, I don't want to suggest, that doesn't mean that Shelley was a kind of climatologist before his time, or that Shelley's embrace of and awareness of nature uh, makes him a, a kind of poster figure for uh, what we might call equal criticism or what we might call climate change activism, uh, because the legacy there is much more complicated. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about that, right? So for example, Shelley believed in man-made climate change. Uh, and you can grasp that and you can say, okay, so he kind of thinks along the lines that we think today, right? We're aware of the effect that human production and human activity has on the environment. So we are aware of the, of the way in which climate change is, is man-made um, but or human-made. Uh, but for Shelley, uh, that was actually understood to be a good thing. Uh, and so when Shelley thought about the relationship between humans and nature, he understood that to be a social and political relationship. And his suggestion was that, uh, that, that human government produces natural conditions and that the good government would make for good nature in a sense. So if you ask yourself, for example, why there are deserts in places that used to be fertile, like the Nile Delta or, or places in North Africa. Shelley's answer would be, and he says this in, in his poem, Queen Mab, Shelley's answer would be that, that what happened in these places is that they had tyrannical governments and tyrannical governments produce depopulation and make deserts. Uh, and, and so the suggestion, the corollary suggestion to that is that better government will make better nature. And so there's a fantasy that Shelley unspools in Queen Mab, for example, where, and this is, has, is deeply ironic to us, right? Where uh, climate will be equalized, right? That good government could cool the poles and make them inhabitable and potentially fertile. Good government would make deserts places where we could grow crops. Uh, and, and so there's a sense of, of climate equality that Shelley sees as being produced by participatory democratic government as opposed to tyranny. Um, and that resonates very strangely to our ears, right? I mean, the, the idea that, that the melting of the poles would be a good thing. Um, and one of the things I think that that underscores is the paradox of Shelley's position, right? He's fundamentally anti-imperialist and you can see that in so much of his writing. And yet his understanding of the relationship between human activity and control over climate, which he links to good government, um, is actually contiguous with the colonial project and with a lot of the rationale for colonialism. Um, and, and so, again, I think that with Shelley, it's always important to, to recognize the ambivalences in his work, whether they're intentional, as they often are in a poem like The Ode to the West Wind, or whether they're more part and parcel of, of his moment in time. Um, so I think you, you, you've mentioned this when we were talking about uh, time a little bit, but um, if we're looking at this last line, if winter comes, can spring be far behind, uh, and the idea of the, cyclic the cyclicality of nature as a source of hope, um, in what ways is that, how does that, how is that optimism articulated throughout the poem, and is that typical of a of romanticism that, yeah, cyclicality is hope? Well, I guess what I find interesting about that is I don't think that there is necessarily, well, how to put it? Yeah, so so maybe, maybe you could think of cyclicality as hope in the sense that it offers a predictable pattern in which what will come next can be determined because it's also what came before. Okay, um, so there's a way in which that, that cyclicality uh, can, can be thought of as, as hopeful, but it could also be despairing, right, in the sense that you could reverse the, the suggestion and say, if spring comes, can winter be far behind? Um, but of course, that's not how Shelley ends his poem. And so what I find interesting and distinctive about that is that Shelley begins, he offers us a representation of cyclicality. But what he's really trying to do 
is to suggest what I referred to earlier as repetition with change. And so there's a way in which the, the metaphor of seasonal repetition, uh, Shelley almost breaks that off and wants to suggest that, wind, that when winter gives way to spring, that that can be a kind of progressive improvement as opposed to merely a seasonal repetition. I think that's very difficult to grasp um, intellectually, uh, but I think that's what's happening in the poem, that, that, that he, when I refer to him as, as wavering between hope and despair, uh, there's a way in which the, the, the changes that are brought by the West Wind are a change of decay and, and, and degradation in a sense. It, it's, it's the kind of downswing of history, if you want to think of it that way. And uh, Shelley is trying to reach for the upswing. Um, and so, and you can see that I think even on a stanza by stanza basis, right? There's a way in which um, uh, there's tension, I think, in, in the first stanza between uh, the way in which the image of, of the wind and the uh, leaves are being described. Uh, and then there's a shift in the middle of that stanza almost where uh, we get into a, a, a more easily graspable and, and, and straightforward image of, of the idea of, of seeds as tombs from which new life will emerge. I mean, there's, there's almost a way in which that is the kind of Christian idea of, of, of regeneration. Um, and and so, uh, so I think that, where am I going with this? I think that, that there's a sense in Shelley's cyclicality um, that there can be comfort in that repetition, but also that we can break from the metaphor and, and see progress as, as kind of trumpeting out of those predictable patterns. Um, and of course, right, that doesn't mean that, that progress will last forever. Uh, there, there, there is an inevitable sense of, of a winter behind the spring that will emerge from the winter. Um, but the question of, of when and, and how that's going to work, I think, is open. Uh, and I think also that, that one of the wonderful things about a poem like this is that it, it keeps the sense of that movement um, in tension, right? The, the, that tension between the repetition of the seasons and the possibility that there will be something else breaking out of them, um, something, um, something like uh, the, the trumpet of a prophecy, right, um, an, an, an awakened earth, if you will. But what's interesting about that is, is the way in which Shelley so consistently couches that in the negative, right? If you look, for example, at, at the final um, trio, uh, the one that comes before the closing couplet, uh, we, Shelley refers to an unextinguished hearth, and an unawakened earth, right? And, and that the use of the negative is very common in Shelley. Uh, I mean, one of the things that it does is, is it offers us um, a sense of, an immediate sense of alternate possibilities, right? That, that if you were to refer to a blazing hearth, um, it's a blazing hearth. Uh, if you refer to an unextinguished hearth, it conveys also the possibility that it could be extinguished. Um, and so there's a way in which what those negatives do is they, they function as a kind of built in both and or, or, or a way of including other multiple possibilities um, in a single moment. Great, thank you. So we wanted to end our conversation with a few questions about what this poem has to say about poetry and, and reading Shelley's poetry today. Um, so Shelley's defense of poetry ends with that very famous, often quoted, maybe misunderstood line, uh, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Uh, for Shelley, what was the role of the poet, especially in moments of political and social turmoil? And does this final stanza of the Ode to the West Wind in particular shed some light on what he really means when he calls poets legislators? Yeah, I would again refer to the term that comes before legislators, right? Unacknowledged, and there's that there's that Shellian negative again, uh, and I think that 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 to me is what's interesting about that. I'll just say a couple of things about that for a start. One is that that um, 
when Shelley coins that phrase that he uses in the defense of poetry, which he's writing in 1820, uh, he actually uses that first in an earlier pamphlet that he wrote called The Philosophical View of Reform. Uh, and The Philosophical View of Reform is a piece, I won't go into the details of it, but it's a piece that Shelley is writing just after he finishes the Ode to the West Wind. So you're absolutely right to, to call up that connection. Uh, and it's a connection that 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 is significantly contiguous for Shelley, right? He's thinking about that when he's writing the ode, he's thinking about that when he writes a philosophical view, and he's thinking about it again when he's writing the defense of poetry. Uh, and so these are things that are very much on Shelley's mind, and they refer back to some of the things I said earlier about the relationship between what we might call passivity and activity or the agency of a poet. Uh, and what's curious for Shelley here is that he thinks of poets in connection with the spirit of the age. And yet the question, of course, becomes whether it's the spirit of the age that is working through the poet, or whether it is the poet that, that is helping to produce the spirit of the age. We're back to the same question as we are with the wind. Uh, and indeed, the wind acts, if you start to think about these things in connection with each other, the wind starts to act as a very nice metaphor for the spirit of the age. And you can read the whole poem, I think, in precisely that light, uh, where Shelley is asking about the relationship between unseen forces that act upon him and the kind of agency that he might exert potentially. Um, and it's again that kind of strange paradox of the wind makes the poet makes make the wind <laughs> uh, make the poet. Um, and, and so um, not to be too paradoxical, but, but one of the things that, that I think is happening there is that that's why Shelley calls poets the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Uh, that, that, that one way of taking that would be to say that it's the poets that actually affect change, they just don't get any credit for it. Um, which is, I think, often the way it's taken. But I think when you start to think about that line in connection with um, the Ode to the West Wind, in connection with other places where Shelley plays with, plays with these ideas of agency, something much more complicated arises, uh, a sense that, that, that one can exert a certain amount of agency on the world, but in exerting that agency, one is also prey to forces that are exerted upon one. Uh, and so there's a sense that, that, that Shelley doesn't want to settle the matter to one side or the other. But what he seems to be saying is that, that poets partake in that spirit and that the works that they produce do have an effect on the world uh, and that they do affect some sort of change. Of course, the question will be when that change happens. Uh, and it may be that that change takes a long time, and that part of the reason that poets are referred to as unacknowledged is because of the lag between the development of their ideas and actual change in the world. That might be one way to think about that line, uh, or another way to think about it. But then, so if, if one of the ways would be that, that poets make change and don't get any credit, one. Uh, if a second way would be to suggest that, that poets make things happen, uh, but that they don't work in a manner that has immediate effect, so it's often difficult to make the connection between uh, poetry and the change that supposedly follows from it. That would be the second way to take it. But the third way would be even more complicated and would have to do with the problem of agency itself. And I think that's one of the reasons that Shelley's poetry is so interesting. What is the relationship between what one can do as a person in the world and what one can do as a person in the world at a particular time with forces acting on one from outside, right? I mean, it's, again, the, the phrase that's often thought of in connection with this, and Shelley calls to mind certain, it was avidly read by Marx, but in Marx's line from uh, the 18th premier of, of Louis Napoleon is that men make their own history, but in conditions given to them from the past. Uh, it's a very Shelleyan idea. Uh, and, and I think that's part of what he's after in referring to the unacknowledged legislators of the world, right? That, 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 that poets work as the trumpets of prophecy, but they also are Aeolian harps that are played by the winds, if you think about the winds as the spirit of their age. So they, they are both formed and forming, uh, if you will. Um, and I think that's part of what that gets at. Excellent. So I think this might be the last question from 
myself and Charlotte uh, before we move on to questions from the audience. Uh, I wanted to give you the chance to uh, answer the question, how do we teach or read Shelley wrong, if that is something? Um, are there common misconceptions about his work uh, or about approaches to romantic poetry that you've come across? And um, how have your strategies for teaching Shelley changed? That's a really great question. Um, really great. How do we teach Shelley wrong? How do we get Shelley wrong? Um, I don't know that I necessarily have a firm or definitive answer to that. Uh, I think that, that Shelley is a poet of contradiction uh, and Shelley is a poet of clouds. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll clarify what I mean by that, uh, in the sense that, that I think that you, you get, that one of the ways you can get Shelley wrong is to insist that he's doing one thing. Uh, Shelley is uh, what Arnold called an ineffectual angel, right? Um, Shelley is, is a poet who um, doesn't... Uh, uh, have any grasp on the actual. He's just simply a kind of airy fairy figure. Or T.S. Eliot saying that, that Shelley is a poet that one that one might like when, when you're juvenile, but eventually you 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 automatically and inevitably outgrow him. Now I'm not saying that T.S. Eliot got him wrong, but I think that it's more complicated than that. That there is a particular strain of idealism in Shelley that we can even associate with with a platonic idealism, the sense that that the real world is is the numinous world that sits behind the, the forms of the world. Um, but I think that, that to leave it at that with Shelley would be a mistake uh, and that it's important to recognize the relationship between Shelley's frequent disdain for the actual or the world that is as it is given to us and Shelley's willingness to engage with that world. Uh, and, and, and that, that the, the balance or the, the, the conversation between the two is part of what activates his poetry. So trying to suggest that Shelley is just one thing, that he's a, he's a political poet uh, that's part of a British radical tradition um, is part of it. Um, or Shelley is an ardent idealist who has no regard for the actual or the ordinary uh, is part of it too. Um, and to teach only one of those halves to me would be to miss the point about Shelley, that, that when I read Shelley, I'm always looking for the tensions in the work. Um, but I think that another mistake in teaching Shelley uh, is to stop short of the difficulty of his work. And if you look at a poem like The Ode to the West Wind, which we've been talking about now for, for quite a bit of time, uh, it's an easy poem to read, I think, um, but it's a very challenging poem to grapple with. Uh, and, and when you start to ask about what it means and what it's suggesting about time, about change, about poetry, about history, about nature, about climate, there's a lot to say. And so I think that, that to some extent with Shelley, we need to recognize that density and that difficulty and not try to think him into making particular points, but in, in showing us how to develop ways of thinking about things. Uh, and by things, I mean things like nature, climate, history, change, poetry. Uh, and, and so I suppose I, I suppose I could leave it there. Um, but but I, so, so in other words, what I'm really trying to say, if, if I were to epitomize it, would be that, that Shelley is a difficult poet to read, but that he is accessible and you can simply read him out loud and appreciate the sounds that his work makes. <laughs> Uh, and then you can start to think about what those words are saying after you've taken the time to, to just listen. Um, and, and that each time you read it, uh, I think that, that, that there's a way in which it, it offers more um, without ever necessarily wearing itself out. That to me is what's interesting about his verse. Thanks, Emily. Um, Charlotte, unless you have anything else, I think ready to pass it back to the audience. Okay, we've got uh, 10 audience questions for you. 
first one is, could it be possible that Shelley was deliberate in sort of shrouding his thoughts in order that his readers could conjure up their own images through his words? This in light of the rapid changes occurring in his era. So, I, I'll go part of the way with that one. And, and my sense is that um, I'm not, I think that that part of the reason, that, sorry, can you start, start the question again for a second? I, I have a sense of where I want to go with it, but I want to make sure I've got the question exactly right. Uh, could it be that Shelley was deliberate in shrouding his thoughts in order that the readers conjure up their own images through his words? This in light of the rapid changes occurring in his era. Yeah. Um, I go part of the way with that. And, and my sense is that, that I don't think that Shelley is necessarily trying intentionally to shroud his thoughts. Uh, and I think that, that nor is he trying intentionally to offer us clear and concrete images. I mean, that, that idea that, that images should always be clear and concrete, I think is, is associated with later poetry, especially modernist poetry, which, which turns so, so firmly around the importance of the image. Um, one of the things about Shelley is, is I think that the cloudiness, if you want to call it that, of Shelley's, the frequent cloudiness of Shelley's verse, I would, I would think about less as an intentional effect to offer opportunities to his readers and more as an effect of the speed at which his mind moved uh, and the associative work of his own imagination. Uh, that, that, that Shelley was somebody who, who continuously wants to associate one thing with another thing with another thing uh, and to push it to the level of the unseen, right? You can think about the beginning of his famous um, hymn, to, to him, hymn to intellectual beauty, uh, which begins, um, uh, how does that one begin again? Sorry, uh, it's the hymn to intellectual beauty which begins at uh, the, the unseen shadow of, hang on, um, I'm embarrassed, I don't have it at the top of my, yeah, the awful shadow of some unseen power floats, though unseen amongst us, right? I mean, that word unseen repeating itself twice in the first two lines, not an accident, not carelessness. Um, he's continuously trying to push for what, what, what can't be seen I think less because he wants the reader to fill in the blank with an image and more because the tendency of his own mind is relentlessly abstracting. And that's one of the things that he's dinged for um, by later critics. I mean, that's, that's what um, Arnold dings him for. That's what Levis dings him for. Um, Thank you. Next question is, is an ode by definition always admiring of its subject, attempting to elevate it? Uh, I guess that's a kind of um, difficult question. I mean, any, any definition that we have for elements of, of poetry tends to be more of an operational definition than a dictionary definition, if you will. Um, that, that rarely can you say something is something in poetry or something works this way without there also being a kind of exception to it. Um, and that's different, I think, for shaping forms than it would be for um, more explicitly metrical or, or, or rhythmic forms. For example, uh, a sonnet has 14 lines, right? Um, it would be tricky to call something a sonnet that had only four lines. Uh, uh, there's a way in which heroic couplet verse, every pair of lines is going to rhyme. You can't rhyme every third line and say this is heroic couplets. It's just that those kind of definitions are, are, are completely functional uh, and, and pretty set, right? I mean, you can vary the rhyme scheme of a sonnet. You can think about Terence Hayes, for example, uh, Sonnets to My Great American Assassin. Uh, if I've got that title exactly right, I, I may not. Um, but but Oftentimes in those poems, each one has 14 lines, but they don't all have a rhyme scheme. Um, they don't all have the same rhyme scheme. Um, they don't all, but, but they do have 14 lines, right? So they're, 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 they're sonnets in, in that sense. Um, and and there's, they have a consistent number of feet to the lines. 
Um, but with something like an ode, which I'm characterizing as a shaping form, uh, it doesn't necessarily have an explicit definition that says, oh, an ode can only celebrate, right? Because you could, for example, uh, write an ode that was satirical uh, or mocking of its subject. But by its origin in, in Greek poetry, odes tended to be celebratory and they tended to be public. Um, but as that shaping form comes down through history and through time, uh, you can more or less pick it up and, and do what you want with it. Um, so you could write an ode to someone that you despised and make your distaste for them pretty clear. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Could you speak a little bit about the relationship between uh, Percy Shelley and Mary Wollstonecraft? How did such intense, powerful personalities manage to live together and create together? Did one inspire the other in their literary enterprises? Great question. Um, just to be clear though, uh, the relationship is with Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft would have been Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley's mother. Mother. Um, yeah. yeah, and so she's associated of course with, with um, feminism and, and with the vindication of the rights of women, one of the most important feminist manifestos that comes out in 1792. Uh, and she dies shortly after childbirth. Um, and, and so Mary Shelley, the woman who would become Mary Shelley, never really knows her mother. Uh, but the relationship between the two is tricky. Um, and uh, there are people who say that, that you know, Mary Shelley couldn't have written Frankenstein, that Percy Shelley must have written it for her. I think that's kind of a kooky theory, and I don't think that holds true if she wrote it. Um, but uh, they did have a very tempestuous relationship, and, and, and that that relationship was not always symbiotic. Uh, and there were, Shelley was, it was notoriously, well, notoriously is maybe the wrong term, but but uh, was, was not a, a faithful husband. Uh, he had all sorts of liaisons with other women. He was consistently trying to explore alternative forms of emotional engagement uh, other than a domestic partnership. Uh, for example, uh, when he married um, Harriet Westbrook, uh, there was a lot of speculation that, that he was involved in, in um, kind of, um, not polygamous would be the wrong term, but, but in um, you know, experiments in free love, if you will. Uh, we don't have a, a ton of information about that, but we do have some. Um, and uh, with his relationship with, with Mary Shelley, we know that he was involved with other women during it. But that, I mean, the, the, the faithfulness is less the issue there. Uh, and at the root of your question, as um, creative cooperation, if you will. And, and again, that was also tricky, um, in part because of continuous and consistent disagreements over how to manage and handle their children. Shelley was restless. He always wanted to move. Uh, and Mary Shelley blamed him uh, for moving, blamed the deaths of their two children uh, for his restlessness, that, that he, was, he was needing to move, he was needing to move the children when they should have stayed put. Um, so there was a lot of resentment that, that, that grew between them over the terrible things that happened to, to their family. Um, but ultimately, after Shelley's death, Mary Shelley became essentially the custodian of Shelley's reputation. Uh, and his father was very dismissive of Shelley's work. And it, it really came down to uh, Mary Shelley and, and Shelley's friend Lee Hunt to try to, to shepherd Shelley's work into posthumous editions. Uh, and into the, the reputation that, that he came to enjoy in the 19th century. So having said that, um, Mary becomes the kind of custodian of Shelley's reputation or Percy Shelley's reputation, but she also does significant work of her own. Uh, and mo much of that work, much of, much of her writing happens after Percy Shelley dies. Um, and, and so, you know, yes, Frankenstein comes out in 1818, uh, but her other novels are later, and, and they, they, they come after the death of Shelley. She settled into her own career as, as a writer after he died. Um, so there wasn't necessarily a ton of, well, I shouldn't say that. I guess that might put it even too boldly. Um, there was a kind of creative cooperation in the sense that, that, you know, when you think about the Geneva summer of 1816, for example, there was a lot of collaboration between these, these figures. Uh, and, and not just in terms of, of 
Mary's production of Frankenstein, but also the way in which um, Mary made fair copy man fair copies of Byron's writing and of Shelley's writing, um, sometimes changing words a, a, as she went. So there, there was a kind of active collaboration in that regard as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Would you call Shelley's aggrandization of the self a defense mechanism against the existential vertigo caused by Darwin's discoveries? Mm -hmm. Not so much, in part because um, because Darwin comes after Shelley, and and so um, you know Darwin makes his Beagle voyage in the eighteen twenties when when Shelley's dead, and so Shelley never got to read Darwin's work. Um, but I'll take the spirit of that question in light of the development of geology and the natural sciences during the Romantic period, and one of the things that people like uh, the Scottish geologist. Um, William Hutton are, are positing, and, and subsequently um, uh, people like, like Charles Lyell, who will come at the end of the Romantic period, also after Shelley, just before Darwin. Uh, one of the things that, that, that people like Hutton and Lyell and other geologists are recognizing is the tremendous age of the earth and how long it takes for the physical features of the earth to change. Uh, and so in the spirit of your question, right, uh, you could suggest that, that that makes clear the worthlessness of a self uh, or, or the way in which a, a human self is, is, is a nothing in the context of, of the vast scales of geological change and, and, and the changes to, to, to the earth. Uh, and so in that regard, um, I suppose that, that uh, the question makes makes very good sense, um, and I don't I don't know if I have a definitive answer to it, uh, except in insofar as it, it would point to additionally certain kinds of, of tensions in the period. Right, one of the things that we associate romanticism with is a kind of valorization of the self, and you can think about that in connection with someone like Wordsworth, Shelley's um, older contemporary. Uh, who, when he turns to writing epic, writes an epic, which later is published as The Prelude, which is about the growth of the poet's mind. So, you know, you, Milton, will take as a subject of your epic, the justification of the ways of God to man. You, Virgil, uh, will take as a subject of your epic, the founding of, of the city of Rome and the Roman people. Uh, you, William Wordsworth, will take as a subject of your epic, your own mind. Um, and so there, there's a kind of narrowing of, of horizons in that, uh, and a kind of valorization of the self that you get from Wordsworth's epic that, that I would say is consistent with much romantic writing, which is immersed in the sense of self and immersed in problems of consciousness and immersed in uh, the relationship between the self and the world. Uh, and, and so I think that, that there's, there's, a, there's a huge valorization of, of, of the figure of the self in so much romantic poetry. And that contrasts and sits in tension, I think, with some of the discoveries of geology and the natural sciences in this period, which seem to point to the fact that human life is fairly recent in terms of the, the changes to, to, to the planet, uh, and that, that human life may be less significant than we think it is. Um, and so I don't know whether I would see the one as an existential response to the other, so much as, as seeing them both as kind of counter forces that are existing and bubbling at the same moment. Thank you. And then we have, we have two people who want to know about um, William Blake, his influence on Shelley, if, uh, if you know of, of a particular connection. Yeah, that's another tricky one. I'm more or less going to pass on that question because it, I, I don't want to get it wrong. But my sense is, is is that, well, for one thing, Blake had kind of a dormant reputation in the period, uh, and I'm not sure that Shelley knew much about the works of Blake uh, and knew much about them, even to refer to them. To my knowledge, uh, there aren't moments where where Shelley refers to Blake. But having said that. You know, I'm sure that somebody could do a quick Google and find a scholar who's published on the relationship between Shelley and Blake. So I want to be very careful about how I couch that. 
Um, but there, there, I mean, there's an oblique connection between them in the sense that, that Blake was a part of the intellectual circle of the publisher, Joseph Johnson, who was also the publisher of Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin. In fact, it was, it was through Joseph Johnson that William Godwin met Mary Wollstonecraft. Uh, and Blake was also part of, of that group, not necessarily at the center of it, but he certainly knew those figures. Um, so there's, there's a way in which you know, Shelley could have, could have known about Blake through uh, his relationship with Mary Shelley's father, William Godwin, but I'm not aware of any significant connection between Blake and Shelley, except insofar as, as they are both, I think, the two most ethereal of, the, of what we consider to be the major romantic poets, but I think they're ethereal in different ways. Thank That's you. Good question. And we have two other questions about that relate to each other about um, uh, how how his his political um, activities were seen at the time. Was he considered? Was he dismissed as just a poet, or was he were his uh, um, were his political uh, activities taken seriously? Um. Yeah. Again. So. He did some funny things. Uh, one of the things that, that Shelley tried to do is he tried to spread these pamphlets all over Ireland, encouraging the Irish to revolt against the, the English. And I think he was doing that by putting, literally putting messages in bottles. Um, uh, and, and so there's a way in which it's pretty easy to shrug it off and to laugh at it and to think rather dismissively of Shelley's naivete in affecting political change. But he was actively trying to stir things up. And, and, and uh, it was active enough so that in his initial exchange with, with William Godwin, right, the, the intellectual exchange that would produce his, his final marriage and, and the significant collaboration between Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley, uh, Shelley was actively trying to stir things up and Godwin was trying to dissuade him from doing that. Godwin wasn't somebody that, that believed in... Um, direct political action. He was much more of an intellectual than that. Uh, and so if you look at the exchange, the early exchange between the man who would become Percy Shelley's father-in-law, William Godwin, and the young Percy Shelley, who at the time was married to Harriet Shelley, Harriet, former Harriet Westbrook, uh, there is this sense of Godwin trying to dissuade Shelley from his, from his aggressive political activity. But if you actually think about what Shelley did in his lifetime, apart from the writing of poetry after he came back to England, uh, there really wasn't a lot of direct political activism. Uh, and if you think about some of the poetry that he wrote, like uh, The Mask of Anarchy, which was explicitly written as a response to the government crackdown on protest and uh, what was known as the Peterloo Massacre, um, it frames the the... the the poem is framed through, through sleep. It begins, as I lay asleep in Italy. Um, so there's a sense that Shelley has of being separate from affairs in England. Uh, and, and so if you look at his, his track record, uh, it isn't necessarily one of, of direct political activity so much as it is one of, of kind of intellectual bolstering of revolutionary or radical causes which isn't insignificant, I don't think, um, but which is different from the kind of direct politics that he seemed to favor earlier in his life. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was a very, very interesting talk. A very, um, very Thomas More appropriate. We had uh, a course last term that on... Uh, the ebb and flow of lived time. And we have courses coming up next term on uh, romanticism and climate change and nat nature. So uh, this is a, a beautiful way to, to tie our terms together.